Well, welcome everyone. We're here to discuss the role of children's media in motivating action on environmental and social issues. And I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. We have with us today, Laura Henry Elaine, who is an award-winning writer and creator of the well-loved CBeebies characters, Jojo and Gran Gran. Laura is also an educational consultant to the media and publishing industries, particularly in the areas of racial equality and diversity. We also have Anna Bassi, Editorial Director at The Week Junior. Anna is at the helm of this award-winning children's news magazine. The Week Junior is one of the UK's fastest growing magazines and it helps children aged eight to 14 to understand the world, inspiring independent thought. We also have Laverne Antrobus, who is a child and educational psychologist. Laverne works with children and families at the Tavistock Clinic, and she often appears in media giving a psychologist perspective on issues relating to children. She's made programmes on childhood uh, for the BBC, Channel 4 and Channel 5. And last, but by no means least, we have um, Joe Schiller, who is executive producer at the BBC Studios Natural History Unit. Jo leads on children's programmes um, and has a broad portfolio, including CBBC's Planet Defenders, Deadly 60 and CBB's Andy's Safari Adventures. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. We, of course, are having this conversation set against the backdrop of 2020, in which there was a universal awakening to the impact we're having both on the planet and each other. Building Back Better is now firmly on the agenda, not only for adults, but for children too. And we're seeing that environmental and social issues matter increasingly to children today. We all know about the uh, school strikes led by Greta that spread worldwide only a couple of years ago. So I'd like us to unpick some of this uh, and its impact on children's media. And I'll start the conversation with some data from the Insights family. The Insights family survey more than half a million children and parents every year uh, to understand their attitudes and behaviours. And they have found that far from being passive observers, children and teens are actually spearheading action against the climate crisis. Access to digital media is very much driving this, exposing children to what's going on around the world and motivating action. And their research found that children as young as 10 to 12 express concerns about issues such as racism and climate change. Uh, a statistic I found particularly surprising is that over 45% of children in the UK said that they would spend more of their pocket money on a product that is environmentally friendly. So I wonder, um, Anna, if we can start with you. I know The Week Junior makes a very conscious effort to inform young readers um, on these issues. In your view, what is the role of media makers um, in responding to children's passion on these issues? And how do you approach this at The Week Junior? I think it's, um, you know, we can't we can't ignore what children are interested in. It is our responsibility to reflect their passions back to them and, and to address their interests and also to, to, to sort of unpick some of their concerns. And as publishers, you know, we want to give children what they want um, and we want to help them to make sense of what's going on. Um, and parents trust us to do that. Children want us to do it and their parents trust us to do it as well, which is really important. We've conducted some research recently um, amongst our subscriber base. We had about 1500 respondents to it. It was fascinating to sort of look through the results of that and to discover that actually 80% of our readers told us that global news is their favorite part of the week junior. That's what they go to first. And parents told us, again, 80% of parents told us that their child cares a lot about the environment environment and the interesting thing there is that compares to 28% of children who care a lot about celebrities and popular culture so you can really see where their interests lie um, so for us I think you know our approach to, to news of, of any kind but especially serious news or, or stories about um, environmental issues or racist behavior is to um, you know, we, we kind of have to come at it very calmly and we have to come at it very factually and very clearly. You know, what we would never want to do is to make children feel worse about the world than they did when they first picked up our magazine. So our role really is to inform them in a very balanced way. I think where a print magazine like the Wheat Junior has a bit of an advantage over digital media is that we are able to um, 
you know, reflect, provide context. Um, we're not reporting in real time. It's very much a reflection of what's happened around the world each week. And, and that gives us the time also to check that what we are giving our readers is completely accurate. You know, we aren't providing them with information out of context. We're not responding in a knee jerk way to news. And I think that is, that's really, really important. And the other thing that we always do is to make a point of celebrating positive action and showcasing it so that our readers are provided. You know, they don't just hear about the problems they can also see what some of the solutions might be and, and, and who are these people who are actually beginning to act upon some of the problems. But the, the other thing to say as well is that, you know, it's really important that children have a balanced media diet. So the Week Junior does cover important and, and sometimes quite serious news stories. And, and, you know, and that is what we're best known for. But it is part of a big mix of content, which some of which is quite light. You know, there's a lot of entertainment. Um, you know, inspirational content and activities. And, and another part um, for us that's become increasingly important over the past year is well-being, which I think is, um, you know, clearly something that's top of mind at the moment for most people and especially for children. So for us, that means helping children to understand their feelings and providing them with tools and tips to, for sort of coping with, with their moods and sort of trying to take control of their lives in, in a way that makes sense to a child. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Joe, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit from your work on the production side of things. Um, how has children's passion for these issues impacted some of the programmes you've made? And have you seen a change over the years in, in interest in these issues? Yeah, I think definitely. I think um, children's interest has grown as as grown up interest has grown actually it's grown alongside and sort of as Anna said it's, it's incredible how much children of all ages do care and in our program we try and sort of address this in two ways I suppose one is to sort of thread these um, issues into the content uh, so for example even with CBB's um, with Andy's you know, um, aquatic adventures we started talking about climate change and and um, sea ice melting and we had a, a lovely sequence <clears throat> when turtles are heading the wrong direction away from the beach you know towards the town attracted by the lights and Jen and Andy go and try and save them but then they propose a, sol propose a solution for the future generation so planting trees to block out the lights and I think this is really important that kids need you know they they're really interested but they can easily get overwhelmed and um, by the, like we all can, by sort of endless doom. So it's nice to think there are small steps that you can take to help, even if they're tiny. Uh, I think that's a really, really important part of, of what we do. And then um, also Steve Batchel in the last series, you know, we didn't used to um, tackle environmental issues. The last series, series four, really went for rhino poaching, palm oil deforestation, ocean pollution. And then we had a digital campaign well, we, we gave pointers about how you can help within the programs. And then we had a digital campaign afterwards, which gave you five things that you can do so that you feel a little bit empowered. You know, it's not going to save the world, but it does make you feel better. And, and we all need to take those small steps because if we don't, then that's when we will be doomed. And then the other approach we've done is like our new series for CBBC is um, Planet Defenders, which is driven entirely by conservation issues and, um, and not only that but we designed it so it's got a tiny carbon footprint so this is all about authenticity it's about young filmmakers with a passion for the environment in their own countries telling stories from their own countries so we have like a vaz uh telling uh campaigning against elephant tourism in india and uh ashwika kapoor uh campaigning for gibbons uh with their problem with deforestation, Jahawi Patoli in Kenya, campaigning for marine protected areas and getting a marine protected area as well while we were filming, which was amazing. So really authentic, young, passionate filmmakers. We're not traveling around the world. We're flying nowhere. We're working with a really diverse cast of people and, and, and getting results and being incredibly inspiring. I think this is the uh, interesting point about Planet Defenders is that I think it is inspiring you know kids like um, being with uh, young adults people who are slightly older than them they really look up to them and they really and we've had already um, examples of eight-year-olds writing letters to their MPs inspired by Megan McCubbin's shark program and saying you know why are you labeling fish and chips as rock salmon that doesn't exist don't you know it's an endangered shark you know so yeah the activists of the future. 
Mm, yeah. Um, Laverne, I, I wonder if we can come to you actually from a psychologist perspective. Um, you know, how young is too young in addressing these issues with children? And, you know, should media be providing escapism from them? Um, what, what role should media play in your view? I don't think there is a, an age that we should be capping things at because I think it's been said before, you know, this is about what children are appreciating alongside parents and their ad adults in their families. So children are hearing this anyway. Um, we know that they're sort of great listeners in to what's going on in, in the debates um, in their families. And I think what media does, it sort of scaffolds it slightly for children in that it's, it brings it in an accessible way. So there are ways in which you bring this to their world, as, as, as others have said, that means that they can absorb it and try and unpack it in, in a way that fits with their sort of developmental track. So I definitely wouldn't be saying that, you know, I think there's enough escapism in children's media, but I think there's also the real world that we live in. And I think to try and sort of sidestep that with children really doesn't work anymore. I mean, they're passionate about their living space, who they live amongst. And I think, you know, what media has the ability to do is really tap into that curiosity that sometimes we can sort of forget young children have, but they want to know more. They want to know what's happening. And I think what Joe was saying about, you know, really being able to create something around accessing diversity is so important. You know, we have got to keep pushing the world for the place that it is. And the more we do that within the media structure, the more children can appreciate difference. You know, one of the things that I think is really the reason why it's important to allow them to become involved in this active world is because essentially, as human beings, what we want is to belong. You know, we want to know that we have a place in society and that our place in society has value value that we give it but it's valued by other people so I think both Joe and, and Anna have, have really spoken to that you know both of the mediums that they're working in invite children in to take their place in society wherever they may be and the wonderful thing about it is that growth and development and learning comes from that so appreciating diverse attitudes um, beliefs is part of how we work out the sort of social structures of the world. Mm, yes, definitely. Um, I'd like to draw on some other statistics from the Insights family who found that children's concerns about racism increased by 100% in the UK and the US since the murder of George Floyd. A concern about racism ranks fourth out of a list of 20 concerns for children uh, in the UK and environment ranks, uh, ranks sixth. These are obviously really challenging issues that even adults find difficult to address. Um, Laura, I'd like to come to you. I wonder, is there a way to address big issues such as racism um, in a way that's age appropriate? And, and how do we empower children uh, without putting too much pressure on them? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the stats speak for themselves there in terms of what you just shared. And I agree thus far with everything my colleagues have shared this morning. I was sort of like, clapping silently under my desk but I think yes I think children we can present what I would call the big things to children and show on screen and in media issues around um, racism and how to be anti-racist although I believe it has to be age stage and ability appropriate because research informed us and I know from some of my day-to-day -day work children as young as, as two and three are have had um racism against them so this is why I think it is super important that we do discuss what racism is what does it look like what does it feel like and it is shown on the screens in terms of how we deal with it in a problem solving way and I think and also to how we share the voice of the child and one of the things that I know on my travels and hearing from parents carers educators and teachers the importance of showing what racism is and how to be anti-racist and how we empower children um, for communities and children who live in places in the UK that is not diverse. Because sometimes we say, okay, then for instance, we've got Jojo and Grand Grand and last year we had the new magazine Copa Girl and Copa Boy come along and we were all saying, hooray, hooray at last. You know, we're seeing black and brown people on screen and in print 
but even more so it is important for children who don't live in diverse communities to see that. So I think we can, I think there's a there's three levels of looking at this is in explaining to children what is racism, why it is wrong, and it's very, very wrong, and why, you know, it's uh, the impact that it has on others. Then we go down the road of looking at how do children become anti-racist? Because I think children do want that. They do want to, well, actually, this is wrong. What do we need to do about it? So we share tips, we share solutions. And then we have around what we talked about thus far in this conversation is how do we empower children that you can be anything you want to be, that we show positive, non-stereotypical images of different people in society because no longer do we have mum, dad, two children. <laughs> you know, we have parents from LGBTQ plus communities. We have communities from the Roma traveling and gypsy communities. Who's a community that's very disadvantaged. And if we're honest, do we see those communities in print and on TV? And young children form their understanding of the world you know, from birth to um, rising pride, their brains are developing all the time. So this is why it's super important that we show this and we have these conversations. But I would say the starting point is we have to start with the adults because it's the adults who already have their, their views. And when I'm delivering training, I have a course called Starting With Yourself. And that's where I think the journey is, is starting with ourselves and being brave enough to have these conversations with children, to show it on the screens and to show it in print as well. Yeah, thank you. Can I say something? I mean, Laura, I think what you've just said is <clears throat> spot on because actually, you know, one doesn't know always um, about your, to, how to interrogate your own views until children bring them to you. You know, I think that um, hearing children talk about these issues really shines a light on the attitudes and values that parents have, that perhaps they're not even aware of how sort of easily transmitted they are to their children. So there is something about a programme such as yours, which I think really brings to light the absence of seeing black and brown people on the TV and how used to that many people have got. Um, and hopefully for children, this is going to become more the norm that they will see people that look like them um, from whatever community that is. Yeah, I mean, Laverne, actually on that, to what extent do you feel children um, have the capacity to understand these issues? Um, you know, do, do they, can they grasp at a very young age issues like racism in your view? I think they can be helped to understand something about difference. And I think, you know, as Laura said, um, you know, we're talking about how do we come at this really confronting the developmental age and stage that young children are at. But, you know, I think there are ways in which parents have to do quite a lot of background to really helping children appreciate this. But media has a fantastic way of just sending those very sort of subtle messages in. And, and I think, you know, that's what I was meaning about, you know, I think we don't always appreciate what's not there until we see it and have a conversation about it. You know, I, I grew up, you know, not seeing very many people that look like me on the TV. And now when I see it, I think, wow, how come I didn't know that? You know, so we, you know, media has a way of being able to fill in the gap. And so children do see diversity. You know, they do see programs where children are front and center talking about, you know, the flavelas in Brazil and what's going on over there for children and having an appreciation of difference and the different lifestyles that we all lead, I think can come into the world of children of lots of ages. What it needs is parents to do that very good, solid backing up, conversational piece to hear what children make of things, not to impose their own views, but to say, you know, what did you think about that? Because that then gives you your lift off as to what children have managed to take in and what they've understood. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that leads me nicely on to my other question. Um, 
the Insights family also interestingly found that during the pandemic, um, there was a rise in children wanting to have their own voice and be the hero. Um, everyday heroes grew in popularity amongst children and celebrity status jobs fell in popularity, replaced by very practical career aspirations. Um, for example, the number of children aged three to 12 uh, who wanted to be a doctor doubled as the pandemic hit. Um, so we're seeing the, the rise in children wanting to have an impact on the world. Um, and I think an interesting aspect of this is this notion of children coming to the realization that they themselves can have a voice um, and can be the hero. Um, Laura, I wanted to come to you on this. Is, is there something significant, do you think, about children having their own voice on, on these kinds of issues? And, um, and how can media makers bring more of that into, into programming? I think, yeah, absolutely. I think children's voice, the voice of the child does matter. And I think in, whether or not it's in animation or in live action, live action programming, that needs to be centre stage. So in terms of whether or not we have a show, for instance, where there's a panel like this, <laughs> where children are sitting down discussing, because in terms of what we do know, how children deal with um, you know, the wider issues, how um, articulate children can be, I think it is super important that we show that, that we sometimes we come at it from adults sort of like pouring into children's <laughs> minds. But I think we need to step back and allow children to have a voice and to have an opinion, because I'm noticing that even with um, my children who are a lot older now, I can see the way how they are with their, you know, with their activism what they're able to say, et cetera. And we see this with environmental issues. You know, if I'm in a school or a nursery, a child may say to me, you know, well, that needs to go in the recycling bin, Laura. <laughs> so they are very much aware in terms of what's going on. They're very much aware of, you know, of, of differences. They're very much aware of, of discrimination. And I think we definitely need to not shy away from that. And I think we need to be brave to give children, you know, to pass on the baton to children to have their, their voice on these matters. Because I bet you, you know, children will all be able to be solution driven. They'll probably come up with all these um, fantastic ways to solve problems. And I do think that, you know, that the, you know, I know it is a cliche, but the, the children are the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anna, I wonder at the Week Junior if you um, have examples of when children uh, have a, approached you with their own voice and view on some of the issues that, that you cover. We have so many examples of that. I mean, they're very, our, our readers are very articulate and, and extremely engaged. And, you know, we, you know, we, we clearly get a lot of feedback from them. We have a lot of letters and photographs and they tell us about fundraising activities that they're participating in, environmental activism, litter picking. You know, I had a letter just yesterday from a year seven um, who presented a very articulate case for uh, the abolition of zoos. You know, they really, they really, really care. Um, we run a feature every week in the magazine called The Big Debate, in which we um, present a, an issue to our readers and, and help them to explore it from, from a couple of different angles. And then they get an opportunity to vote on that. We have a very high level of participation in, in that online poll. Um, so it's always very interesting to us because that also gives us a, a gauge as to what really, um, you know, what really is lighting up ch children's passions. But, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the examples that I, I, I think I'm, I'm most proud of in the sense that it is evidence, really, I guess, of, of the power of the voice of, of children and, 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 the, and the opinions of children. And, and, and also that we, you know, demonstrating that we are listening to them, which is also so important because there's no point in encouraging children to shout and to avoid. You do have to actively listen and, and act if you can. And, um, when we first launched the magazine, it was delivered to our subscribers in a recyclable wrap. Um, and we thought that was the right thing to do because it would be, you know, it was environmentally friendly or what we felt at the time was the most environmentally friendly way of delivering it. Actually, as the um, years went on and our readership grew and our coverage of, of climate and environmental related issues grew <laughs> in, in line with that, um, we began to receive regular correspondence from our readers asking us why we were continuing to deliver the magazine in a wrap 
even though it was recyclable, it wasn't widely recyclable. It wasn't something that could be put out for curbside collection. Um, and that in fact, we were um, hypocrites for, you know, on the one hand, writing about the dangers of plastic pollution and on the other hand, actively contributing to it. And of course they were absolutely right. Um, and we then, um, you know, and we, we had letters from whole classes of children, some of whom actually threatened to cancel their subscriptions if we didn't do something about it. So, you know, they were incredibly passionate so we then, I mean, it was something that the company had already been investigating. I know Dennis is very committed to sustainability and, and to doing the right thing, but it, it definitely accelerated the programme. And what happened after that was that the um, our production team looked into a variety of different ways of delivering the magazine. We looked at things like compostable wrappers, but which actually, again, turn out to be not that compostable. They're not as environmentally friendly always as they sound. So we felt that wasn't really the right solution either. Um, we, we looked at paper wraps. Again, there were some issues around that at the time. And eventually we settled upon the idea of delivering the magazine with no wrap at all. You know, that being the most environmentally friendly way of delivering it. Um, but we knew there'd be dangers with that. So we, we involved our subscribers in a test. And we took a big sample, we took a sample of several thousands of families um, and we sent their magazines to them um, unwrapped and we asked them to feed back to us um, and to tell us how the magazine had arrived. You know, was it badly damaged? Was it, was it OK? How would they feel about it arriving damaged? And actually the overwhelming response to that was positive. Um, you know, readers were really happy that we'd taken the wrap off. They didn't mind a little bit of damage and they knew that if, you know, if the magazine was unreadable, we'd replace it anyway. So we launched that. Uh, we, we went full, full, fully naked in August of 2019. Um, and we did that um, with a big cover story about it and a big a feature about it in which we paid tribute to the readers that had forced us, forced our hand really. Um, and we provided more examples within that of other, other young people who were doing amazing things um, to, to help the environment. And that, you know, that had an incredible response. And, and, and by and large, it's, it's been a massive success. We do occasionally hear from people who've received a soggy magazine, but will always, always replace it. And, you know, I think that that is something that we, I'd like to think we would have done it anyway, but I, I know that our readers made us get to the solution faster and I, and I can't thank them enough for that. So yeah, the power, power of kids. I would also say though that I'm, you know, I agree with absolutely everything that everybody said and, you know, children are very, um, you know, they're fiercely in favour of justice and fairness. Um, but I do think we have to be incredibly careful not to um, put the weight of the world on their shoulders to make them feel that they alone are responsible for finding solutions they want to they definitely have a part to play in it and they and they need to have the opportunity to do that but I, I read something um last year in Catlin Moran's book um in which she described the effect of children overhearing their parents talking about the climate crisis or talking about political dif difficulties and failures of leadership and just the sort of caution that should be applied when we speak in front of children and, and we just have to be careful not to pass our own anxieties onto children that you know we, we need to always be able to address these things in a calm and measured way and, and in a very supportive way which I think goes back to you know what, what Laura was saying also about um, you know the, the parents need to lead that conversation as well they need they need to provide the support they need to listen and they need to be you know the, the they need to, to sort of proactively address things like anti-racism and, and, and the climate crisis with their kids rather than perhaps letting children find out about it by accident and drive themselves into a frenzy of fear. Yeah, yeah thank you. Just to come, come in there quickly in terms of echoing what you say there, Anna, and I think any show that shows that deal with these bigger things so it doesn't have an impact on children in terms of their anxiety because we know over the last year or so a lot of children have been suffering with a you know anxiety depression it's a way of when we are showing sharing things in print and on the tv where we have some footnotes available for parents and carers and educators and teachers so that they can help to support their children emotionally with the, the deep levels of understanding and it's not about shame and it's not about blaming it's about dealing with it with that matter and that's why I think it's important especially on the you know on the BBC there's always sort of like a footnote of agencies of support that families can go to you know and I think that's always super super important that that's there that there's that little you know um 
warning, supportive mess message where children and their families can go to for extra support that we just don't leave them with all this information and creating a worse situation than what it was it already is yeah yeah I don't know if um, Laverne if you have a view on that from a psychologist perspective um, just the role of media and media equipping parents to be able to address these issues with children too is there a place for that? I think the two go hand in hand you can't have one without the other I think that we want to give children the opportunity to encounter, um, you know, issues and sort of find themselves in them in a, in a safe way. But parents have to be very close by. And I think Anna's completely right. You know, we know it's the biggest pitfall that parents feel they're having conversations in isolation to their children. And their ears are sort of twitching as they try and work out where they fit on the spectrum, which is why I think the media is really helpful because it gives them another plug-in point. I mean, obviously very, very young children, we have to absolutely be very careful about. But children who are fundamentally going through their stages of development, where they are curious, they want to know what the world means for them, and then their parents have the conversation with them. And that's why I always say, you know, it's about what did you make of that? What did you think you learned? You know, the, the, the way in which um, as adults, we can very quickly impose our own footprint on children without giving them a chance to sort of let us know whether or not they really are thinking about climate change in the way that we are as adults, or whether or not, I think, as you know, Joe's saying, there are, are there very small contributions that they can feel very, very sort of pleased with and sort of courageous about without thinking they've got to be responsible for the very big, big bits that adults obviously have to take up. So absolutely, I think it's, it's this sort of joint um, energy that both children and their parents have to bring to these issues. Yeah, I mean, Joe, from uh, your experience on Planet Defenders, that's obviously led by young filmmakers. Um, how important do you think it is for media to engage with children on the issues that they feel passionate about? Um, you know, is there something about them having their own voice and, and self-expression? Um, it'd be good to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think there's two things there, just picking up from um, what Laverne was saying. I think this idea of hope um, and it's some kind of positive side to things is really, really vital. So um, uh, with our film about, um, you know, against riding elephants and elephants in captivity, which is that causes appalling suffering to elephants, you know, at the end, we meet the elephants that have been saved you know, in the river, happy elephants, you know, I mean, it's not, an, it's not a happy ending to the wider story, but we have a happy ending there. I mentioned earlier, Jehovah Batoli actually manages to get an increased marine protected area for these incredible dolphins and, and wildlife off the coast of Kenya near Lamu. So we're always trying to also say that, you know, to, to see the hope, we don't want to leave people in this terrible doomy world, um, but you but you need to be able to inspire them. And I think what I hope that um, Planet Defenders does, I think, you know, for the Greta generation, I think it's great to see these very young filmmakers who are just only out of university in their early 20s, you know, just that little bit older, but, but still cool. And you can see that they're, it doesn't matter if we're there or not, they're doing this they're picking up whatever they can find, their iPhones, their cameras, they're going out, they're telling their story in their own countries. Um, so we're getting the story inside out. We're not jetting people into um, other countries and, and seeing it from, from a different point of view. It's a, it's a sort of very authentic and a voice. So I think it's an inspiring. I hope it's inspiring. That's been our, our, our feedback that that's something that you can do. And when you can sort of get, I mean, even Greta was accompanied by her dad, you know, around the world till she was 18. You know, there's a, there's a limit to what you can do when you're a child, but you can have the thought that it's possible. And I think that's great. And it's possible whoever you are, wherever you're from. Absolutely. And what a great note to finish on. Thank you so much, everyone, for your rich um, contributions. Uh, it's been a really valuable con uh, conversation. And thank you also to the Insights family for sharing their research with us today. Hopefully this is a conversation that continues in various forms. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, MJ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.